Welcome to the All About Digital Marketing podcast, the show all about digital marketing, digital marketing, digital marketing, digital marketing. Brought to you by Social Inc., the digital marketing agency specializing in social media and content marketing for brave brands and forward thinking SMEs. I'm your host, Chris Bruno, and as always, we're here to bring you the most actionable tips, tricks, tools and insights to help you achieve more when it comes to your digital marketing. You can find all the show notes and all the episodes on www.allaboutdigitalmarketing.co.uk. If you enjoy the show, feel free to subscribe and of course, share with a friend who you think might find this useful. Hey everybody. Chris here, and today we have a special guest, Matt Johnson, who is really all about podcasts. Matt runs an agency, Pursuing Results, which is focused on providing turnkey podcast services and podcast PR. Suffice to say, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to podcasting. As we continue to create new episodes for the All About Digital Marketing podcast, I'm happy to say I've taken away loads from our conversation, and I'm pretty sure you will too. Whether you've already started a podcast or you're thinking of starting one, you'll find this interview really, really helpful. Remember, you can check out the show notes and find all the links mentioned in all of our episodes on our website, www.allaboutdigitalmarketing.co.uk. Enjoy. Hi, Matt. Thank you very much for joining me. Chris, super excited to be here. So, Matt, for those who don't know you and who don't know Pursuing Results... Uh, can you just tell people a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you started doing this? Yeah, so a quick snapshot of where we're at now. So we, we are a podcast production and PR agency. What that means is that we work with like six and seven figure business coaches and consultants, and we help them launch a podcast that essentially helps them break in and dominate a super specific lucrative niche. Uh, so we do all the back-end production. We also book two guests a month for their show. We also do the you know, email and social media promotion on the back-end. So essentially, it was modeled after what I built for myself for my first podcast, which I wanted to just be able to show up and have super awesome conversations and then walk away and not have to worry about the rest of it. So I had already built the team to do that for me. Uh, eventually, that turned into us running an agency where we do that for other people. So our clients just show up on Zoom like we're doing now, have really awesome conversations with other influencers, or they record solo episodes, and then we grab those recordings and do all the rest of it. So it's essentially 100% turnkey podcast production. That's absolutely awesome. And to be fair, I'm slightly upset that we met four weeks after I launched the podcast on my own <laughs> with my team, figuring out everything from day one and scratch ourselves. <laughs> but that's not the point. It doesn't matter. Um, Okay, so what's the main belief for you behind podcasting? Obviously, you started podcasting. You're now encouraging other people to start podcasting. What's mm -hmm. the number one attraction to podcasting for you? Mm. So besides the fact that I just love ideas and conversations, uh, right now, I, what I'm seeing in the world of like influencers and entrepreneurs is that podcasting has become the new networking. So when I look at like how my, like the guy that I used to work for who ran the agency that I came out of, he had to fly all over God's creation, you know, buying bottle service in Vegas for people at 3 a.m., like trying to convince them to give him a credit card that would hopefully offset the cost of the trip to get there so that he could come back home with, a, you know, one or two more clients to turn over to his partner. And that, that was like five years of doing that before he was able to actually build something that started to run itself. And so I haven't had to do any of that. Four years ago, I was just some dude working at an agency, but he had the idea to start doing some business development with influencers in the space and, and base it around like live webinars. So I ended up hosting like live webinars with a bunch of influencers that they had relationships with. And it was a niche that I was familiar with because of my background. Um, but one of those people pitched me on the idea of starting a podcast together. I'm like, well, I, you know, I'm a big fan of podcasts, but I've never hosted one. It sounds fun. Like my, my potential co-host was interested in uh, selling coaching in that space. And then I was interested in, in tinkering around with developing training and education products. And so we're like, okay, let's, let's do it. So we launch a podcast, um, you know, flash forward four years later or whatever, that's at 1.1 million downloads. It's was named one of the top five uh, podcasts in that niche. Um, and has, has done really well. It's a ton of fun. I still drop in about once a week to host that. We, um, uh, my partner, you know, is the primary person on that show. And yeah, like that experience started exposing me to relationships and hooking me up with a bunch of 
people that were super high level and very influential in the space. And that did a lot of things. Number one, it turned me from a, from a nobody into a fellow influencer. It allowed me to meet potential clients without ever leaving, right? So I'm based in San Diego. I virtually don't have to travel for work. I travel by choice. And I don't have to go, I don't have to do things that I don't want to do to get clients because I can reach out to virtually anybody I want with, with a few exceptions, but I can reach out to virtually anybody I want and either book them on my podcast or pitch myself as a guest on their podcast. And what I've noticed is, is that the quality of the relationships that come from that is better than I would ever get by trying to shake their hand in between a session at a conference. And I'm not super good at that anyway. I don't know about you, but I'm a natural introvert that's learned to turn it on when I need it, but may, it burns me out really fast, right? So me showing up and having to do like 16 hour days at a conference is like, it sounds like the worst thing in the world. And I know there's probably a lot of people that can relate to that. Uh, and the great thing about podcasting is that I don't have to do any of that because I can specifically laser target exactly the types of people that I want to work with. And I can either talk to them directly through podcasting or I can go one level up and I can talk to the influencers that they look up to and I can have them on my show and vice versa. So um, to me, like podcasting being the new networking, that's the number one thing uh, that I think is so important for people to understand about podcasting. It's not just about hosting a show and it's not about the audience. It's about the relationships you build. I think that's really interesting. Actually, it's the, the new version of networking. And I think that's quite cool because the same way as, you know, your website is definitely as important, if not more important than your shop front or mm -hmm. your call office or whatever it might be. Your social media is your, your two way conversation with people and your podcast becomes your way of networking. And like you said, so we're a completely distributed team. None of my guys come into any offices. We don't have any offices. Uh, we're quite happy that way. We don't want any. Um, yep. but the idea being that actually we meet and we talk to people from all over the world. So we've got yeah. connections from the olden days and again, sort of know people from Gibraltar. So we work with them. Recently, we started working with two companies in Holland and we've worked with people in Dubai. We've worked with people in France. We work with a lot of companies in the UK that are based all over. And actually, mm -hmm. like you just said, everything has changed. So looking yeah. at the podcast as a way to actually network is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. How, how yeah, do you think it fits in? Oh, sorry. I, I just, yeah, yeah, I just agreed. It's, it's, a, it's been a huge game changer. And, and I think more people are kind of getting, getting turned on to that fact. Yeah. And how would you say it fits in as part of the bigger digital marketing scope for a company or for an individual? Mm. I, I love that question. Um, so I'm working on a book right now that's going to come out in a couple of months to kind of explain that. So I'll give you the, the quick rundown. Uh, to me, where it fits into the bigger picture is if you are, I mean, I don't, I don't care who you are as far as a service provider, but ideally you look at yourself as a leader, right? You're, you're a thought leader, you're an influencer, you're supposed to be leading your clients to results that they couldn't get on their own, right? So we're all leaders. For those of us that really step into that, uh, I think podcasting gives us a couple of things. Number one, it gives us a platform to lead people, right? To deliver content that will cultivate you know, the right beliefs over time and kind of incubate people into becoming ideal clients, even if they didn't start out that way. We can use guest appearances on podcasts to then reach new audiences and leverage those and kind of pull in people from the outside world and get them to give us permission to stay in touch with them. So we build our email list and we build, build that asset of permission, right? And then, the, then that solves, to me, it solves the, the other problem that I think most entrepreneurs seemingly go to bed and wake up thinking about, which is what in the world do I post today that's going to get me to grow my business? And to me, we're starting with the wrong question. I think the problem and the reason why we wake up every day wondering about what to post, or if you're in a big company wondering what in the heck your people are posting, right? I think the reason that we wonder that is because two weeks ago, we weren't being interviewed on a podcast or hosting our own show. So we don't have long form content to pull small chunks out that we can post on social media. Like if you look at what someone like a Gary Vaynerchuk actually does, yes, he's engaged to a point. But most of the content that you actually see him pump out is pumped out by his minions, which are like his content team of 19 people, right, that he uses for promoting his own personal brand. So what you're actually seeing somebody like a Gary Vaynerchuk do is he has built a machine behind him that he just kind of steps into and, um, and it pumps out content for him and then he engages on top of that. To me, that's where all of us need to go. And the only question is, well, how do we build that machine? We don't have 19 people. My answer to that is we really only need one person. We, it doesn't need to be us, but we do need somebody. Um, so that's my, my big vision is I, I, want, I want my clients, I want my friends, I want everybody in this world of influencers and agency owners and creatives. I want all of us to have 
a person that is like their ally in the battle for attention that produces their podcast, gets them featured on other shows, and then pulls micro content out for social media and takes care of all that behind the scenes. So the, the person, the leader at the top of that just is like they just they step into that content machine almost like they were stepping into a BMW. The, the micro content is really interesting from, from my point of view. We often talk about strategy, uh, you and I actually, before we started the podcast officially, we were having a quick chat and we mm -hmm. talked about it again, strategy being the number one. One yeah. of the biggest things that we find, doesn't matter on the size, big, small, or anything else, when you explain to someone, okay, right, so you're writing one big core piece of content and they go, yeah, and then we post it on social. Yeah, and then what do you do? And that's it, it's died. <laughs> right, so, it's silence, and, crickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you hear the crickets, my shoulders drop, people in my in the room with me or that can see me in a cafe think I've just had the worst news in the world. But the thing <laughs> is that people don't realize how much all of this is usable. And when you do do a video or when you do record a podcast or even when you've written a, a long format blog or a 2000 word blog, you've got something that you can now read out loud. If you wanted to, you could take clips out of it. You can make quote graphics out of it. You can, from a podcast, we use headliner uh, to create smaller chunks and then use those to promote the podcast that we're actually talking about. There's a hundred different ways from one particular blog post or one piece of content. And you're right. Gary V talks about it loads. And a lot of people, I think, I like the idea of having the one person behind you uh, for our clients. Obviously it's been a, a team. It's the company that, that, that kind of helps them. Yep. But I think the biggest thing is actually even understanding that themselves. So mm -hmm. the biggest takeaway from this for me and for anyone listening would be, you know, no matter what that one piece of big content is, it's not one social media post worth. It's yeah. 15, 20 social media posts worth if you know what you're doing and if you're looking at it in the right way. And I think that's yep. kind of a, a, a really important part. So yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I, I guess this leads in really nicely to the next question that I wanted to ask, but, <laughs> and there's probably some selfish reasons considering we have just launched a, a podcast, but mm -hmm. marketing a podcast. So we just mm -hmm. talked there about the idea of, you know, repurposing, taking small clips, using that as part of it. But what would you say are some of the key points for anyone who's looking at starting or just starting to help them actually market the podcast and to get people to, uh, to listen to it? Okay. Well, obviously, you know, the strategy is the most important thing, right? Getting the positioning of the podcast right and really going after a hyper-focused niche. To me, that's the fastest way. One, one of the biggest issues I have with clients that come in when they, first, when they first come into our world and want to start a podcast is they're not really, they're thinking of themselves more than they are the audience. They're, they're thinking of the content they want to push rather than what is their ideal audience searching for and where are they looking for it. So if you can kind of refocus around that right away, that, that will help solve some problems. Now, just tactically, like what, what small things can you do to promote a podcast? Um, a couple of years ago, Tim Ferriss put that question out to his audience. And I read that there was probably, his, his audience is insane. I swear there must have been 400 comments on that post. I read every single one of them. And the consensus that I found was that the only thing he wasn't doing that they wanted from him was smaller, short clips that made it easy for them to share it with people, right? So his audience was already looking at people in their life and going, you know, I bet they would love the Tim Ferriss show, but I can't just tell, I can't send them a link to an episode because all they're going to get is eight minutes of ads. And then 45 minutes later, he's going to say something really awesome and significant that they should hear. And I think that's one of the big problems with podcasting is just, you just have to, it's, it's one of those, it's like, it's like an LP back in the day in the seventies. Like you had to sit and stew with it and marinate it, right? right to, to listen to, you know, to, to get to know the music. Uh, and so his, his consensus out of that was, okay, we need to start doing highlight clips from the podcast. And, and that's what we, we immediately started implementing that for all of our clients. And that still to this day, as many people as I've talked to that have podcasts, nothing has topped that. So for example, with our, with our clients, the vast majority of them record on Zoom like we're doing now, but with video, because we want them to be on YouTube to be more easily found. And we're going to pull out a two to three minute video clip of that podcast. And we're going to throw it up on like natively uploaded to Facebook specifically. It's also going to go up as what I call a lead generation clip to YouTube with its own title, its own additional tags to hopefully catch the SEO traffic of a very, very specific answer to a specific question that their ideal clients might be searching for. So to me, I don't know of anything else that tops that combination of just using and leveraging a highlight clip. And you mentioned headliner um, or audiogram, like those types of things. So if you're not on video and you're wondering how to reproduce that, you can absolutely reproduce it. You basically just take your audio, pair it up with a little graphic 
and it you know has the little audio you know stream on it. So um, that that works really well. So I don't think it's quite as effective as video, especially on Facebook, but uh, it is the next best thing if you're running an audio only podcast. Okay, my next podcast is definitely going to be video as well then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. What's the biggest piece of advice from your side, biggest piece of advice to anyone right now that's sat there that's going, you know, I've got a bakery or I've got a small flower shop or whatever it is, but they want to do a podcast. They've been thinking about it. They've been talking about it. Maybe they've even had a couple of drinks with friends going, we should definitely do one together. But what's mm -hmm. that one biggest piece of advice about getting started and getting out there and doing something? Well, I think the biggest, especially for that type of client, it's not so much you know, it's not so much about the audience. Let's put it that way. I would focus more if I were running a podcast for, you know, like a medium sized company or a local business or something like that. I would look at a podcast as an easy way to reach out and build a network of people that have had a great experience and a great conversation with me who can then send me referrals. And then I would then, you know, follow up and keep a good relationship with those people through, you know, like thank you notes and cards and stuff like that. But anyway, point being, I think we get really, really wrapped up in who's listening, how do you get more downloads and all that stuff. And the bottom line is if you, unless you're really nicely, tightly defined and you go after a very, very specific niche of people who are looking for information that you have on how to solve a specific problem, right? To me, that's when a podcast has a potential to kind of grow and catch like wildfire and start getting a lot of downloads right away is people are already looking for it and all of a sudden you step into that gap and you fill that need. So if you're not doing that, right, if, you're, if you can't, like if you run a business where you just can't get that hyper-focused and you're, it's more about branding and it's more about communicating with, with a, a, like an email list or something like that, to me, I, if you start by focusing on relationships first and you use your podcast to build this network, right, and let's say you run a podcast for a year and it's a weekly show. So you're inviting, let's say, four people a month onto your show. By the end of that, you're going to have, what is that, 50 people? Yeah, 50 people. So you have this network of relationships with 50 people. If they're the right people, you're going to get referrals off of that. In, in real estate, they, they talk about how like every, every potential referral source, even for a real estate agent where the deals are, they only come around like every seven years, like people only move houses every five to seven years, right? So they don't need your stuff every day. But every potential business or, or influencer in the community is worth one to two referral or repeat deals every single year. So theoretically, and it's not, well, and it's not really just theory because people prove this all the time, the people that really use this strategy, people that have 50 really good solid referral partners are selling 100 homes a year, which is you know, 10 times what the average real estate agent does. So that's just a very basic example of how a local service provider can use this strategy. Um, the problem is people get hung up in the, in the numbers. They get hung up on the audience and they ignore the opportunity to build a strategic referral network of using the podcast as a way to get them on the phone. That's really interesting. I've, I've never thought about using the podcasts for the relationship building side of things. So mm -hmm. for me, that's kind of opening a massive door and something that I need to look at in a lot more detail from our own side. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we can we can chat about that offline, but yeah, I mean, for agencies, just a, just as a quick aside, uh, yeah, I mean, it's for example, my own podcast. I invited, I think I was introduced to her by a mutual friend. I invited um, an agency growth consultant here in the states onto my show. We had a lovely conversation; it was great. Uh, we really hit it off, and uh, we just have similar beliefs. It like. At the end of that conversation, she was like, I have a client that needs to talk to you. Let me, ma let me make the email introduction. Like it happened just that fast. I got introduced. We hopped on the phone. We did a podcast episode. Immediately, I had a referral. Like it can happen that fast. So yeah, once, once you see the possibility of that approach, I mean, to me, it's, it, I, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a missed opportunity, especially for agencies. Well, actually, that probably brings me on to something quite interesting. Do you find that most agencies are good at promoting themselves? <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're universally terrible. I, I hope I'm better than average because um, we, we do, you know, like what, what do they call it? eat what you cook? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't secretly, like here's, here's what I've, I have found with other agencies. They'll be selling content marketing, blog writing, blah, 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 blah. Then you find out that they actually grow their own business by hosting podcasts and showing up at events, right? Like it's completely different. I, I can honestly say, 
like every potential client I have, I have met through podcasting and the referrals that have come from podcast. Like it all came from relationships that, that were developed from podcasting. And the, you know, the new crop of, of clients and stuff like that that we've signed up over the last year or so, they've all come from podcasting and, refer, and introductions that, that were surrounding that. So I can very clearly say, like we, we do exactly what we say and recommend to our clients. And that's exactly how we've grown our business. I, I do think that sadly is rare in the marketing world, uh, especially in the agency world where, you know, it seems like um, what they're selling to clients is not exactly what they're doing to grow their own business or they believe in it and they know it works, but they kind of, you know, the clients always come first and we kind of, you know, we do a halfway job on our own marketing. Uh, I think that's also common too. It's, it's a really hard, it's a hard thing to overcome. It's not easy. And I think that's, we should always put our clients first. So my recommendation for probably other agencies, if, if they're listening is what, while your own marketing off from the stuff you do for clients and have it done by separate staff, same systems, but different staff. That way their number one priority is your own marketing and not the clients. Cause the clients are always going to come first to somebody in operations. Yeah, I agree. It's something that actually we, um, <clears throat> we found ourselves kind of slacking at the end of last year and mm -hmm. we put in place a monthly challenge for ourselves as an agency. Mm -hmm. And this was interesting because some of the ideas, uh, my team will be listening to this and thinking, yeah, he's going to tell that story and we hate him for this. <laughs> uh, but, so it started off with something as simple as there's a creative hub here in the UK called One Minute Briefs on Twitter. And basically you have 60 seconds to come up with a brief idea for a brand or for an idea for a product or whatever it might be. And mm -hmm. we decided that actually we're going to get involved every day. It's a minute. So in total between knocking up something, posting it, maybe five minutes in total every day. So we do that and we get involved. We ended up winning um, a, a brief for KFC, which was phenomenal here in the UK. They, they hosted one um, and it was a, a prize draw kind of brief. And we won that. We were super proud of it. And we've wow. carried that on ever since. So since um, I think it was beginning of March, every single day we've had to take five minutes creatively to come up with an ad idea for something really random that we have no idea about before that day's up. So that was our first one. And then they kind of went from there and we decided to do live. So for 30 days, we went live every single day. So one of the members of the team, anywhere we were in the world, whatever we were doing, weekends and all, we all went live at least once, uh, at least one of us, sorry, went live every day. And then we got to June and we thought, you know what? Our biggest product that we sell is the content marketing side of things. And for mm -hmm. us, if you don't have good blog content, if you're not using that as a core part of one of your strategies or a core part of your strategy, then we think there's something wrong. So we, yeah. cha we challenged ourselves. And I say we challenged ourselves because they'll all say I challenged everyone. Uh, but we did a <laughs> in the space of 30 days. And that was insanity. Mm. But the idea behind it wasn't to, to kind of try and boost our SEO rankings or anything else. Those are all byproducts. It was the point to show small to mid-sized businesses, if you can't post once a week, if you can't create something once a week, then it's an excuse. It's not true. It's, we don't believe you. Like yeah. it's, it, it's impossible. We did it. Yeah. And we've done all of these things on a maximum kind of extreme level. The same with the podcast. That was a monthly challenge. We will get this up and running, set up recorded, published, hosted on Apple, on Spotify, can't seem to gain Google, but apparently it'll come eventually. Um, <laughs> but the idea was, there you go. Like we're going to do this in a month and in four weeks we did it. And yeah. we launched with a couple of episodes pre-recorded. I think we actually had five or six pre-recorded. Uh, mm -hmm. We had an interview as part of that. We had made stuff, but one of the episodes, the very first one, we didn't know what the, call, the podcast was called. <laughs> <laughs> And literally we were like that, but it doesn't matter. Like we know what we want to talk about. <clears throat> and the first right. one was talking about this idea of starting a podcast, but why does everyone have these limiting beliefs? And I think that's probably bringing me to the, the, the next question, which is for all those people that are sat there and they talk a great game when they've got a glass of wine in their hand or whatever it might be, <laughs> what are you finding that are the biggest barriers to entry? Because let's be honest, it's not the tech. It's not, you know, with a pair of AirPods and an iPhone, you can start recording. It won't be the perfect yep. quality, but it doesn't matter. But what are the biggest objections that you've come across that people set themselves uh, in terms of actually getting started? Uh, well, you've, you've got your run of the mill imposter syndrome and that can be an issue sometimes. But if, if, you, um, if you get past that, I think the next, the next most important one is just, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to talk about. And having conversations with other people definitely solves some of that. But I, I do think it's important 
if you are like if you if you're expecting a podcast to lead to new clients, they want to hear from you. They don't want to just hear you interview other people. So I, I strongly believe that. Um, and I've started to shift my own podcast from having like one solo episode a month to like one solo episode for um, almost for every interview that I do. Um, and the key to that, I think, like when we take in new clients where we help them map this out. So they, they come out knowing kind of, okay, here's my topics for solo episodes. Here's, and we base that around what are the thing, what are the beliefs, the values and the opinions that that podcast host has? Right. What are the things that they can share that are unique, different, interesting, arresting, surprising, compelling, polarizing, and all that stuff, right? So just let's make a list of everything. Now let's refine that down to, okay, what are the few, maybe five or 10 at the most core beliefs that people need to have in order to not only buy from you, but then to, to be an ideal client for you, right? A client that you love even after they pay you. And if you can hit uh, continually and you just create solo episodes around those five to 10 core beliefs, that to me is what turns your podcast from just a way to keep in mind and stay in touch into something that actually incubates and creates new potential clients for you down the road. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Which is where a lot of people also slip up. Uh, I think half of the podcasts that are out there are like six months old or less. I, I think a third of them aren't even active anymore, right? They haven't released episodes in the last six months. So there's a lot of people that launch podcasts there's a lot of people that are launching new podcasts right now and three or six months from now, they're not going to be releasing new episodes anymore. And part of that is because they are, they don't know how to get quick wins out of a podcast and a podcast by nature is a long-term strategy anyway, but there are ways to get quick wins that a lot of people don't know about. And, but they also don't know how to do the right things now to incubate clients to sign up six months from now. And they can't handle the time gap between that. Right. So if you understand more of that, you understand that the, you know, one of the biggest things are how to overcome that big question of what the heck do I talk about? And you have a list of topics that you can always pull from and you just turn on the microphone and just record something. It doesn't need to be epic. It doesn't have to be, you know, book publishing worthy, just record something um, that will make the podcast much more effective. And if you hang in there three and six months from now, you'll have people coming back to you saying, Hey, I've listened to like five or 10 of your podcast episodes. Um, where do I sign? Like yeah. I, I have clients right now that sell an extremely, extremely unique and high trust financial product. Let's put it that way. It's, it's, it's unconventional. It bucks all of conventional wisdom and it takes a lot of trust and a lot of content to get somebody to come up and say, I'm ready to go. Right. And they have people, I think it's at this point, one to two leads off the podcast per week. So eight to 10 per month of people essentially coming to them, reaching out, scheduling a call. And when the guys show up to the call, the prospect says, I've been listening to your podcast and I'm ready to roll. Where do I sign? And the only question is how much money am I going to hand you? Yeah. So if we do the podcast, right, if we do those things and we talk about the right things and we just hit those things over and over and over again, that's what happens, you know, six months down the line into a podcast. It's interesting actually. So we were talking with Eugene Kahn last week, co-founder of Macan, um, ex-editor of Hypebeast. Guy is mm -hmm. phenomenal when it comes to storytelling. He hosts a podcast as well. Um, we were talking about it because everyone seems to want to start a podcast. But mm -hmm. it reminds me of five years ago, everyone wanted to start a blog. Maybe 10 mm -hmm. years ago, but yeah. uh, showing my age now. The, um, <laughs> but five years ago, 10 years ago, everyone wanted a blog. So what happened was they set up a blog or the YouTube channel or whatever it might be. And what happens invariably is like exactly like you've mentioned. So I'm six weeks into it. Nobody's picked up the phone, called me and offered me a million pound deal. Uh, <laughs> this, this is no good. I don't want to, I don't want to play anymore. So it literally right. just dies a death. And he was talking about it. And he was saying, you know, podcasts aren't necessarily right for everyone. And mm -hmm. this is something that I think the way he put it was, if you would do it, regardless of if you were getting paid for it. So in other words, even if it made no money, would you want to do this? Do you enjoy the process? Would you carry on doing this six months from now, a year from now, even if it made zero money? And I mm -hmm. think that's a really interesting thing. And I'd like to ask you the same question. Would you say that's an important factor in this? Because all of these things for us, whether it be social, whether it be uh, blogging, content for SEO purposes, campaigns, advertising, it doesn't matter. It's all mm -hmm. about doing, trying, testing, seeing, getting that feedback and then sort of evolving from there. But the most important thing is always that, no, you don't post twice on social media and then say social media doesn't work. Right. Like, would you say that's the same from your point of view for, for podcasts? I would say it helps. It, it definitely helps you get through 
you know, what, what Seth Godin calls the dip, right? The, the, time, the time gap between when you feel like you're putting in all the effort and when the results start to come in, right? There's always that dip where things just get tough. And yes, hosting a podcast where you just genuinely enjoy the conversations and you enjoy doing it for its own sake is hugely helpful. And I know, I know I'm in that boat. Um, if you don't feel like you have that and you're looking at it strictly as a way to grow as a, and as a new media method or a, or a tactic, uh, I do think it helps to focus on the relationships and turn those into quick wins and use it as a way to build a, a network of, like if you, if you use a podcast to build a network of referrals and then you are actively keeping in touch and kind of furthering and building the relationship behind the scenes with those people that you have on your show, I think it definitely gives you some quick wins that allow you to see the podcast as a success, even if the numbers are not exponentially taking off like you would like them to, and you're not the next Joe Rogan or the next Gary Vee. So if we get the, if we get the right quick wins, I think it comes down to more than just passion. Uh, I do think people get led astray a little bit in the sense that when they launch a podcast, they look for, they look for an idea for their podcast that I call the magic umbrella, which is um, an idea that's so broad that it can uh, allow them to talk about anything they want to talk about and promote anything they might ever create to anyone who might ever want to buy it. That, that makes it really tough for a podcast to take off because people aren't necessarily looking for that information. Your information ends up being really scattered. It's all over the place. People can't basically scroll down the list of episodes and even tell by the titles who the podcast is for, or what they're expected to learn, where, where are you leading them? Like what, you know, what is this all leading up to? So um, yeah, I, I think the, that's the only word of caution I would say about that is it's great to start a podcast just on a topic that you can talk about forever because you just love it and you're passionate about it. But not if it means starting a podcast that's so wildly unfocused that it can't grow. That's quite interesting as well. I, I think, so we have this conversation with clients every time we start with the basics of the strategy and they'll start telling us about all the bolt-ons, all the additional things that they do for their clients and all these right. amazing, little, wonderful I love, things. I love do. that phrase, the bolt-ons. That's awesome. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm totally, totally going to steal that by the way, because I love go, that. <laughs> go for it. Eugene stole something off me the other day as well. I said I'd send Did him really? an invoice. The same thing. <laughs> send him an invoice. Um, that's but, right. It's like, you didn't know that I had that copyrighted and trademarked? Oh, yeah. that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, royalty check. Thank you. Um, but the idea being that they want to kind of focus on all these other things that they've done once or that, you know, they helped that one person that one time in that one situation. And you're sat there going, none of those things matter. And when no. we start with anyone, but it's true though, it's their extra bonus points with a client there that, you know, they're the things that you get a pat on the back. And if you're lucky, the guy buys you a beer for it and says, thanks. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. main thing is always coming back to this core service. What does your company actually do? And anyone mm -hmm. who starts by telling us they do 122 different things, we automatically have alarm bells ringing and we just leg it, basically. We're trying to get out of the meeting as quickly as possible. But when you sit there and you actually break it down, usually they have two, maybe three core services. And they'll be interlinked, whatever it might be. So if they're in events, for example, it's event marketing, it's event management, and then it's event uh, organization for all the back end kind of crap for it. So mm -hmm. we look at it and we go, forget about all the other bits because it's not about because that one time you got them an article and an interview in the magazine that no one cares. Yeah. But what's yep. the main focus? And I think that's really important because you just said it there for the podcast. What's your podcast going to be about? And again, every interview I've done so far, we've ended up on some sort of a, a wild goose chase, just kind of going down the rabbit hole, talking about something else. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we're always trying to figure out what are the best tips, tricks, ways, methods, the, the, the principles behind small to mid-sized businesses and how they can use digital marketing. And the reason why we say it is because there's so many amazing podcasts and I listen to them. You've mentioned one of my favorites, Tim, um, mm -hmm. who helped me to lose, you know, 18 kilos some five years ago, three years, four years ago, <laughs> uh, with the four hour body. And I read the four hour work before that and started trying oh, to no. push everything out to VAs until you realize you're doing it wrong. And then you bring everything back in house. But that's right. <laughs> the idea being that, you know, they're so far away from, where people are right now. And I think this is the thing that we get sort of stuck on. So you listen to somebody, you know, a Travis from Uber or, um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the company is, but somebody talking from, you know, a multi-million pound, they've made it and they can give you these ideas and these tricks and these challenges and the way they got over it and how they dealt with it. But the reality for me is that's so far away from where somebody is today. And mm -hmm. not only that, but it's so unlikely that, you know, your company is going to become the next unicorn. I'm being honest right. when I say this, you know, like there's, 
Mm-hmm. There's very few trillion dollar, there's very few trillion dollar companies. There's, there's very few billion dollar companies in comparison to the huge amount of small to mid-sized businesses who are making really good money. Mm-hmm. You know, making a few million, making 20 million is not a laughing matter. I mean, it's huge. And I think this is where people kind of get lost and they kind of focus on the Gary V. And like you said, you don't mm-hmm. need to become the next Gary V, but you could be the next Gary V for the thousand or the 5,000 people in the UK that work in X mm-hmm. and you will be more than wealthy enough to be able to cover all your bills and to pay and to have a good life and to travel and to do whatever you want. If you can understand that, you, like you said, the niche that you're going after, Seth Godin, who talks about it as you know, your minimum viable audience, Mm. Who are you actually doing this for and why? It's not about you. It's not just for personal gain. It's not to give yourself a pat on the back at the end of the week, but focusing on that core audience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there, there's, there's all the benefits of it. I, I think the main thing that holds us back is just fear. Fear of focusing, fear of missing out, fear of putting all, all of our eggs into one basket and having you know to watch that one basket, right? We always want to hedge our bets. You know, like the question that I hear you know, and I've heard myself ask it. I've also heard clients ask it, which is, well, why can't we do both? <laughs> and that, that, is, that is the eternal question, right? Why can't we do both? Because you just can't, right? Because it just doesn't work. <laughs> That's the deal, you know? We can't do both. Why, why can't we sell to both the, you know, why can't we sell to the mainstream and, you know, the top people? Because they, they just can't. Like, they make decisions differently. They spend their money differently. They have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, why can't I be in this niche and this other niche over here? Because that you just can't. <laughs> it's like it's, it's, it just doesn't work that way. You know, now, I, I can say this. It, it all ro- it's, it's funny because it, it all roots in human nature, right? It's, it all has to do with how human beings think. We have a hard time linking any one thing with you know, two niches or whatever. Like we we want to say, what is, what is Matt, right? Podcaster. Great. Like if I try to stand for two or three different things, if I came on here and I wanted to talk about like business development, personal development, you know, like all the other stuff that I'm passionate about and excited about, or, you know, God forbid we talk about music or something like that. Like who knows what category people are going to put me in. Like I need to reinforce the perception that Matt equals podcasting, right? Because if I try to get two or three or four things stuffed in there, what I'm going to end up doing is just making sure that they don't remember me at all. And that's worse. But we want to live under the fantasy that we can talk about and do and offer 17 different things, like you said, and it just doesn't work. We can't do both. I think that's, um, again, very well put in that sense. And it's this idea that people are too scared or like you said, human nature, the psychology of it. Mm -hmm. It's a panic stricken moment of what do you mean? I can only be in one niche. Why, why do I have to put into (laughs) that box or, Yeah, yeah. And that's true. But again, like we, we talk to people going, there's nothing wrong with being front and center, the celebrity behind your small business. Yeah. Like ultimately, you know, you read the reviews and stuff, and I've got an amazing team and they talk to my clients and my clients love them and all the feedback I get is phenomenal about them. Mm-hmm. But invariably people will go, I want to talk to Chris. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's part yeah. and parcel of building a small business. And one day we'll get to a size where I can't talk to everybody, hopefully, and then it has to be slightly different. But I have no issues being front and center and making sure that people know me, just like you said, but I want to be digital marketing. Not for, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to go work for, actually, maybe Google. That'd be quite good fun, but only because I've seen their canteens and stuff like that. But um, <laughs> the, the main thing is I don't want to work in a massive company. I don't want to work in a FTSE 100 or a Fortune 500 company where I'm mm-hmm. sat there all day arguing over some absolute numpty about whether or not the typeface should be in this format or in that format when it goes on a business card. <laughs> like the thought of that kills me. So and again, I've got no issues with that, but I've chosen kind of where I want to sit. And I'm really happy with the small to mid-sized businesses because I love working with them because they're ballsy, they're daring, they're the incumbent, they can come out fighting and swinging and they're trying their best and they're, they give it a go and they'll do things differently and they'll be a little bit more outrageous maybe than the bigger brands. And that's what you want. That's what I love yeah. working with and that's how they end up getting results because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Right, I know that in terms I'm of sorry. time, we're, uh, <laughs> we're getting a little bit closer down, but uh, I always end with the same two questions, but uh, one of them stolen from Tim, but not this one. The biggest single piece of advice you'd give to anyone and it doesn't have to be 100% podcast related it doesn't have to be professional or personal it can be whatever you want but just that one little nugget from your point of view this is what you'd recommend um honestly i i think the main thing i always recommend is for people to hire someone right now 
And the reason I say that, especially to people like solopreneurs and freelancers and marketing people that are just kind of doing it all themselves, um, hiring somebody else, even if it's for five bucks an hour for a VA in the Philippines to work for you five hours a week, right? So a hundred bucks a month or something like that. What it does, is it starts you on a personal development and leadership development journey that will change your life. So the process of forcing yourself to sit down and think about what you do and what you shouldn't be doing and what you should be handing off to somebody else and starting that process of like bringing somebody in, helping them to build a system, documenting what you do, you know what I'm saying? Like all that stuff, just that natural, normal process. If you haven't gone through that, it's really interesting. So I've gone through it. I've helped people on my staff go through it by giving them the freedom to hire their own person to raise up to either replace them or assist them. And I've watched people go through that leadership journey and it, it just, it changes your perspective on the world. So if there's one piece of advice I can always give to virtually anyone at any level, it's, it's to hire someone right now, especially if you don't have someone hired assisting you in your own business right now. Awesome. I like it. So we've, like I mentioned earlier, it was Tim Ferriss four hour work week that got me into the idea of VAs. Um, yeah. and proud to be able to sit here and say, actually one of the VAs that started with us back in 2017 today is our head of social media works full time with us. So nice. I really do awesome. believe in the, uh, in the VA system and the VA model. Hmm. Um, okay. So finally, where can people find you online? Where can people find out more about Matt? Yeah. So uh, for the podcast production service, go to pursuingresults.com. Uh, we do have a course because we don't offer this as a service of, of getting people featured on other podcasts, which to me is the really the first step. So if you're not ready to launch a show and be a host, um, great. In fact, I recommend that people start by getting featured and getting interviewed like I am here. And this is exactly how Chris and I met. I had my assistant reach out to Chris. We researched the podcast. We felt like it was a good fit. We felt like I could bring value. My assistant reaches out. They facilitate. They set everything up. And then I show up and just have an awesome conversation. Everything else happens behind the scenes. So if you want that operating in your own business, you can absolutely have that. If you go to howtogetfeatured.com, I've got a training that actually shows you exactly how to get, how to get featured, how to find the right podcast, how to pitch yourself, how to get on the show and actually speak in a way that gets you ideal clients, right? And then we talk a little bit about how to, how to basically hire somebody and we have the training for them that you can just essentially say, hey, I bought this for you, go show up here. And they get four weekly calls and all the training that they need to come out fully equipped and they're going to pitch you starting in week two. So you probably have podcast interviews showing up you know, on your calendar on week three and four, if they go through this particular program. So anyway, we, we only sell the podcast production service that we work with clients. So that's why I created this training course for VAs to help get more feet, more people featured because I see the need for it. All my clients needed it. I needed it. So I just built the system for myself and then we sell the training. Awesome, man. So I yeah. need to ask the question obviously, cause Matt equals podcast. So how did I do <laughs> It was very good. I had a blast. This is one of the most fun conversations because I, I hate the word interviews because I, I don't want to listen to podcast interviews. I want to listen to conversations. And that's exactly what you and I had. Like this felt like we just happened to have the recording, like a tape recording on and you and I are sitting on a couple of couches in a bar or something, you know, talking about growing an agency. So the, to me, these are the most fun conversations to have. Uh, and I hope, I hope podcasting goes even more in this direction. Let's put it that way. Awesome, man. Thank you very much, Matt, for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll do this again sometime. I think we will. Awesome. Thank you. There you have it. Matt Johnson equals podcasts. And more importantly, we're doing a good job at having these conversations. If you're thinking of starting a podcast, ask yourself a couple of questions. One, who's it for? Who's the audience? Just like Matt said, try to find a niche that allows you to create something that has real value for one particular audience, rather than trying to get out there in front of the masses. And number two, would you keep pushing through, as Seth Godin calls it, the dip, to get you through those hard times when you're not seeing the results that you were hoping for? Whatever you end up doing, we'd love to hear more from you. And if you've just started a podcast, drop us a link to it and we'll have a listen. Remember, you can find all the show notes, links, and details for our guests on our website, www.allaboutdigitalmarketing.co.uk. Take a moment to subscribe on our website or on your favorite podcast app, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. See you soon.